Good morning. Again, we're together while we are separated. I thank the Lord that in the face of the present distress, we've ability to do what we can. Appreciate our elders' concern for our spiritual well-being. And I'm thankful for each one of you uh, that are interested in spiritual things, high and holy things, that uh, we're all doing what we can to uh, do the Lord's will, edify one another, and be edified. Uh, in this present distress. The title of my lesson this morning, I've taken from an article I read uh, entitled, When God is Small. I believe we all know that God is not small. Paul told the Athenians, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with man's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God created the universe and fills the universe. Uh, the psalmist tells us there's nowhere uh, one might go that God isn't there. Uh, so the fact is God is not small. But sometimes we downsize or minimize God when we begin to view other things as being bigger than God. For example, uh, Sarah's attitude towards God's promise that she would bear a child, uh, her doubt was bigger than her faith. In Genesis chapter 18, beginning at verse 10, and he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door that was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? saying, Surely I shall bear a child since I am old. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Another example is Mary's question to Gabriel after Gabriel had told her that she would bear a son. And uh, her question seemed to come from her uh, viewpoint that reproduction had to follow nature's course. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Then in verse 37 of chapter 1, it says, For with God nothing will be impossible. So when things seem insurmountable, man very often reduces his faith in God's ability and tends to put God on the same level as man. Uh, Jesus' apostles were uh, guilty of this. You know, it's as sincere as the apostles were, it took them a long time to, to really grasp Jesus' true identity and his divine power. Uh, on one occasion, with all the miracles they had witnessed, too often they saw Jesus as a man. In Matthew chapter 8, uh, verse 24, while they were crossing the sea, uh, Matthew records, and suddenly a great tempest rose in the sea so that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Then the disciples came to him and woke him, said, Lord, save us. We are perishing. But he said to him, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the wave obey him? The question, who can this be? I mean, really, after healing Peter's mother-in-law, after seeing God, I mean, Jesus healed the multitudes of sick and demon-possessed people, you know, it's obviously at the time they were simply seeing Jesus as just a man and not really the Son of God. Sadly, too many people and many in the church have the same kind of mindset. We fall victim to the attitude that says, maybe God can help me, but I'm not going to get my hopes up. There's a story told about a young boy that was traveling by plane to see his grandparents, and he had to be seated by an older man that was an unbeliever. The man noticed the youngster was reading a Bible lesson his parents had given him to work on, and he taunted the youngster by saying, young man, if you can tell me one thing God can do, I'll give you a big shiny apple. And the youngster, without hesitation, replied, mister, if you can tell me one thing that God can't do, I'll give you a whole barrel of apples. Well, let's think about this. God is small when we think people are big. One of the problems men have is that too often we place our respect and awe on the wrong shelf. That is when man's opinions and rules receive, receive our respect 
uh, our fear and allegiance, when we listen and to and give credence to man's commands, when our faith is based not on God's word, but man's word, when we fear man more than we fear God, these attitudes, in fact, fact make God very small in our mind. And that's not a new problem. In John chapter 12, John tells us, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Here is the reason Jesus emphasized the importance of fearing God more than man. He said, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. You see, when we consider the power and the influence, importance, or the threats of men bigger than God, we actually become slaves of men. And we live the life that they want us to live. Uh, it's interesting to me that many people deny Christ and Christianity, uh, accusing us of having a religion of fear, fear. And they say that ridiculing us for, you know, trying to live a life of obedience. Uh, I ran across what uh, one ex-Christian wrote. He said, Christianity thrives on fear. Humans often have a natural fear over issues such as meaning, death, and loss. What better way to deal with that fear than to create an elaborate story about an almighty creator who offered a way to life after death? A story that captivates those looking for meaning and reassurance in their lives. But what keeps these people loyal to the story? Yet more fear. If you leave after learning the truth, you will have to face something worse than eternal non-existence. So people stay. Regardless of what the fellow says, the fact of the matter is everyone uh, fears something or someone in life. And it's just like we will all always obey and serve someone, and you will always trust and believe someone. But of all of the choices that we can have to believe in and fear, God obviously stands above in authority and power and wisdom and in righteousness. And God expects us to fear him to stand in awe of him and have that deep abiding respect for who and what he is. There's always been this great discussion about the meaning of that word fear. Does it mean that we're to be afraid of God or does it mean that we're to respect God? One preacher said he thought of the term in the sense that we needed to take God seriously. And I thought that was a pretty good uh, thought. The truth is fear is a combination of being afraid and having respect. When we respect the authority of God and love him, when we serve him with all our energy and all our will, we have nothing to be afraid of because the consequences of sin have been removed. First John chapter four and verse 18 says, for there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear because fear involves torment. But he who has fear has not been made perfect in love. Paul wrote Timothy saying, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and in love and of a sound mind. You see, the reason Jesus died was to remove the doubt and fear from our minds because he's provided a way to remove our sins so that we can live life uh, with hope and joy. But non-believers and disobeyers, disobeyers really need to be afraid because God is a God of justice. The prophet Isaiah wrote, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell in the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell in the everlasting burnings? Hebrew writer says, for our God is a consuming fire. You see, it's like this. God understands man's mind. He knows what makes us tick. And he understands what motivates man. For some, the only way that you can get through to them is to warn them of painful consequences. And maybe fear will open their minds to listen to God's word. Then there are those who respond to the message of love. They don't need to be threatened with punishment because they see and realize how much God loves them. And they respond in kind by loving and obey God's word. The truth of the matter is, the further that man moves away from God, the more man embraces the world. And then the more uh, man becomes afraid of what others think of him. You see, a religion of, of fear is not Christianity. It is, on the other hand, the religion of trying to remain politically correct. 
When we take God seriously, understanding his love, but also his just nature, people will have no power over us. They won't be able to manipulate us or pressure us or control us. We will live our lives for Christ and not for men. Another thing I think we should think about is God is small when our circumstances are big. You know, it's tempting to argue that the present circumstances that we're suffering make it nearly impossible for us to live a Christian life. But think about it. Have you ever read in the scripture where God excused people's sins because of the circumstances they were experiencing? Uh, think about the story of Achan, who violated God's command. In Joshua chapter 7 and verse 1, the historian says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things, for Achan took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. And because Achan disobeyed God, the historian tells us that many suffered. But just who was to blame for Achan's sin? Was it Israel and Joshua for not having uh, established more safeguards to keep men like Achan from stealing? You know, did they need to plaster warnings on every man's sword, sword don't leave the plunder alone? We live in a culture that tends to blame wrong choices that people make on the system, on past family life, bad teachers, law enforcement, injustice, and even inanimate objects. But when we look at the story of Achan, you see that not only the, that the only safeguard that Achan received was the warning, do not end up cursed. In Joshua chapter 6 at verse 18, God warned the people saying, and you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. And when it came around to it, God exposed the sinner, Achan, not the system that didn't have enough safeguards. The problem we have today is that the free will of man is overlooked and often ignored. Uh, the focus is uh, how investigations might indicate that more safeguards might have prevented people from making bad choices. Uh, but the truth is the planning and preparation, the checks and the double checks, all the training manuals, confiscation of dangerous items cannot overrule the power of one person's decision to engage in evil. And this is not a political statement, just simple truth. Uh, at the end of the day, no one, whether it be God or man, can force us to make good, good choices. And unless our motivation is the genuine love for God, all the compelled choices in the world cannot save us, even if we're choices to do the things that are right. Hear what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. Paul says, Though I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. My grandson is sequestered like most all the other school kids these days. And uh, my daughter gave him a job to do. And his job was to sit down and write all the widow women in their church uh, notes. Now, that's a wonderful thing to do, good to do. But uh, my daughter told her mother, that she hoped that the widows never found out how much blood, sweat, and tears went into getting the job done. It's like Paul tells us that unless our motives are righteous, our actions, even though right, are unacceptable to God. As Paul says, with just uh, some loud noise. But finally, think about this. God is small when my desire is my priority. How many of you ever heard the saying, I just believe God wants me to be happy. This is a pretty popular attitude these days. And most often you hear it expressed in the context of rejecting some Bible teaching that goes against what a person desires to do. You hear it a lot when someone learns that their marriage is unapproved by God because of an unlawful divorce. And they reject the scripture and justify themselves by saying, well, I believe that God just wants me to be happy. And the truth is, God wants his people to be happy. 
simply stated by Paul in his letter to church of Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. God has created man and created the universe to provide man with contentment and happiness in life. Of course, sin has tainted God's creation, but God still wants his children to enjoy life to its fullest within the parameters of his instructions and commands. The problem is we learn that when we investigate this idea further, that being happy is only a code phrase for doing what I want to do. In essence, when somebody says that, they're saying, this will make me happy. This is what I want to do. So I expect God to approve it. Uh, it's nothing more than a blanket over an attitude of selfishness. I read a story one preacher told about his dad's sense of humor, and he related his dad's favorite joke. You see, there's these three men discussing what man's greatest achievement might have been. One said that it was when man landed on the moon. The second man said that when all the modern cures for the multitude of illnesses that man has had. However, the third man said that it had to be the thermos. Well, the first two were kind of confused and I asked him why. He said, a thermos only keeps things hot, uh, keep hot things that are hot, cold things that are cold. Uh, to which the man replied, yeah, but how does it know? Like that, there's a problem when you hear someone say they know what God wants. And they do that to justify their quest for the exciting, emotional, and new spiritual experiences without understanding with what the Bible tells us. They assume that because something makes them feel good, that it's impossible for God not to like it. But the question has to be, how do they know? For example, a young college student, maybe away from home, chooses a church to attend because of all the social and recreational activities they offer. But Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, and his church is not about eating and drinking. A lady switches churches because she likes the entertainment excitement of the worship service. And when she's filled with emotion, she declares, here's where God has directed me to attend. But there's, where in the scripture does it say that God tells us that worship is about our own desires? You see, God must be the focus of our praise and adoration. And clearly, Jesus teaches us that the worship that God desires and approves us is done in spirit and in truth. Man's track record for regarding and elevating our desires above God's will is pretty dismal. Uh, the prophet Hosea was sent to such a people. Over and over again, Hosea condemns the Israelites for exalting themselves and their desires over God's law. In Hosea chapter 10 at verse 13, he writes, You have plowed wickedness, you have reaped iniquity, you have eaten the fruit of lies, because you trusted in your own way in the multitude of your mighty men. In chapter 11 at verse 7, he says, My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. And because of that, the prophet says their fate was sealed, and it was their own fault. In chapter 4, verse 6, the prophet says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I'll also reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. You see, they did not consult God, but they turned to their idols, and they allowed their desires to direct their spiritual aspirations. In chapter 4, verse 12, it says, for my people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. For the spirit of idolatry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot. You see, that generation and others like them are guilty of making God small. The psalmist writes in Psalms 34 verses 1 through 3, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall consist continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Carl Boberg wrote this poem in 1886. After spending a day uh, which he had witnessed both the beauty of creation and the power of the summer storm. He wrote, O Lord my God, 
When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the world display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. God should never be small in our minds. We must always inhibit in our heart the place of honor. Then and only then will we be willing to humble ourselves before him so as to be exalted by him eternally. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, you are indeed great and awesome and glorious. Dear Father, please help us always to magnify you, Lord. Help us to devote our lives to your service, to love you with thankfulness. Dear God, we pray today for your comfort, encouragement, and strength to endure the difficult times. Dear Father, watch over this congregation of your people and bless us. Heal the sick, strengthen the weak, and guide us in all the truth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.